Hello, it's only the bonus round of Developer Diary for the Chrome Dev Summit website with me, your host. No, don't. I'm not going. I'm not taking it in that direction. We've got this far without me being ridiculous. Too ridiculous. Let's just move on. Um, so, good news. Yay. Thing that I've added to the website is uh, this. Uh, this little this little, little button in the corner. However, when you click on the little button, out comes the notification settings for the Chrome Dev Summit website. Yay. So the idea we had was, well, you know, obviously push is a thing. Let's add it to the site. And so that people can um, be notified when any of the sessions start. Or as you can see, if there are event updates like, I don't know, um, uh, I'm sorry we're running late, or don't forget to get your, you know, passes, or whatever, whatever people need. Um, so when you click on it, I guess I've already, yeah, there you go. Show notifications, uh, so I'll allow that. And it goes off at the back, uh, it sends the registration across to the back end server, and then doop, there we go. Once it's got a response back from the, the back end server that's storing these subscriptions, it does that. And uh, um, tell you what, let me register for Darren's keynote, like so. Over here, on my other machine that you can't see, that I can see, that is down here, that's why I point it. I've got my admin interface for the back end server. Bear with me. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let's let's pretend. Let's pretend, you and I, now, that it is in fact the day of the Chrome Dev Summit. And uh, and you know, we're off. We're we're doing whatever. We're doing whatever. And we send out the notification for the keynote. And all being well. La la la. There we go, in the top corner. Chrome Dev Summit, the keynote with Darren Fisher is starting now. And then when you click on it, because it'll be the live, we'll actually take you into the Chrome Dev Summit site or whatever, and you'll have the live stream and off you go. Great, okay, let me show you around the code quickly for the things that I think are interesting. If you're interested, I can show you the backend code in another bonus dev diary, just let us know in the comments. For now, I'm just gonna be concentrating purely on the front end stuff. <laughs> And a lot of it is actually state management, so I'm not gonna dive into too much of that because it is quite sort of nitty gritty. Have they clicked this button? Have they done that? But I'll, I'll show you what I think hopefully makes sense. So the thing is, the first thing I suppose is in the service worker installation bit, I listen on the ready of the service worker installation. And if there is a push manager in the registration, then I initialize my push manager, which I changed this morning to push handler, but I haven't pushed the code to GitHub yet. So this is still the old name for it because I didn't want to conflict with the actual push manager. I'm an idiot. Like anybody needed a reminder. However, nonetheless, we have this init, and in the init, we have this setup, which is gonna basically fetch from the remote server, which you'll see is the cds.push.appspot.com. And when it fetches that and pulls that back, I've set it so that cdspush.appspot.com will respond with the public key that, you, that it needs in order to do the registration, okay? So we get that and we basically store that back. Now I'm using Jake's uh, IDB key valve uh, to do this because um, his uh, IDB key valve is basically is like this lightweight, super lightweight um, thing that sits on top of uh, index DB that makes it behave more like local storage. Because I just want like name value pairs, but I don't want to spend all my time. I don't want to use local storage because um, it's synchronous and it can be slow apparently. And uh, IDB is, you know, is the right call here, but I don't want to do all the kind of transaction open a database, blah, blah, blah. I don't like that. It's not a nice API. And so Jake's written this IDB key val, which kind of does the get, set, delete keys, all that kind of stuff. And it's really nice and lightweight. So I'm using that. Uh, so we basically store the app key. And uh, then we basically do a bunch of updating of the initial view, which is set up the the controls, make sure that any buttons that are on screen say the right thing so that if you've if you come back into the site. So for example, let's go actually, let me show you this. Um, when we go to the schedule now, and I go to Darren's keynote, uh, it says notifications enabled. It already says that because that's what that, that function is doing. It's basically looking for any of those in the update current view. It's looking for any of the existing buttons in the page. And it says, switch them to notifications enabled or disabled, depending on what we've actually got in the, in the key val, the IDB key val value for that session. Fair enough. 
Uh, and that's largely what that stuff is going to be doing. It's like find, yeah, you see update current view, find the notification buttons, um, you know, find from the IDB key val whether it's disabled or enabled for that particular thing, and so on. Uh, processing changes is not simply disables all the buttons, uh, finds out what the current value is, updates it um, using this push manager, and then it you know does a bit of toasting and all the rest of it to kind of say what happened. The actual getting of a subscription is quite uh, interesting. You uh, ask the service worker, and if there is a subscription already and the key hasn't changed, that public key on the server hasn't changed since, you can just return it. Otherwise, I set the key val uh, for the app key, and I ask the registration for a subscription. And you have to set this user visible only to true today in Chrome. It basically is the key that says, if I get a push message, I will definitely show a notification. And the other thing is the application server key, which is a base64 encoded version of the public key or something. Oh, no, 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 it's not. Actually, you have to convert the base64 over to a, a uint8 array. I don't know why. I'll be honest with you. It was one of those moments when I saw that. And I was like, I mean, surely if I gave it a base64 encoded string, it would be able to do it for me. Maybe I should give that feedback. Anyway, push manager handles the kind of global, do you have a subscription? If not, do you want one? All that kind of stuff. The push controls, not uh, a lot to really talk about here. I mean, I know there's a, a, like, it looks like there's a little bit of showbiz going on with that kind of woo and the woo. But really, you know, mostly no. Um, and so uh, the way it actually works is, in fact, let me just slow it down in DevTools. And you'll see this actually in Canary, it's a bit blurry. So I might take a look at that today. Uh, in fact, let's go at 10% speed. And OK. The elements that are doing things are these. There's this, uh, which is the, basically it's the button. And then there's the headline. And then there's the list. And the headline and the list are basically faded out and they're transformed down by 100% uh, of the containing element when they're when it's collapsed like this Whee! and faded out. So I as as I have a, a ripple inside here and the ripple basically expands to be big enough and it's in so this okay let's go back. The, this containing element is however big it needs to be and the ripple always expands and it's overflow hidden. So as the ripple expands it's just a circle that gets bigger. It basically hits the edge of the that block and just disappears. Okay, that's one bit. Then the meanwhile, the button and the uh, the headline and the list they're just basically sliding up and fading in. And because of the timing of it, mostly you don't really see. There you go. And it's all scales, transforms, all the usual, and opacity. How do we make it friendly for the compositor? The usual tricks. A little smattering of will change or whatever, uh, and you get you get that effect. There you go. And then the picking up the buttons is again it just tells the push manager oh this you know they clicked on they clicked on this and so it disables the buttons makes the remote request when it comes back it enables all the buttons. Right. Final piece of the jigsaw today is what happens in the service worker when you know you got that the message coming in. Blip. How does that work? Well. When the when you have a registration, there's an endpoint and some keys and I think that's mostly it that you send to your server, and uh, there's a library called Web Dash Push, uh, which we can link to in the notes, and it will it generates all the keys you need and does all the things you need to have a server in JavaScript to basically encrypt a payload, which is great, and Ping the endpoint that you got from the subscription process, and uh, that's what it does. Yeah. So that means that on the client side, on the on the Chrome side, uh, there's in the service worker that you register this on push, so that when the endpoint gets pinged, so you make your registration, you get an endpoint, you send that to the server. The server then pings it with a payload. That causes whichever messaging service is actually underpinning all this to actually ping back your service work and go, by the way, a thing happened. Yay. Which we get in the on push, right? So that's what happens. We ping the endpoint. And I get the payload I give it is actually the slug of the session. 
So like slash dev summit slash schedule slash keynote, something like that. And what I then do is I just sort of set up an, uh, an initial uh, an initial payload for this the push, uh, the, the notification. And then I basically I look up the sessions. And I go through and I look to see if the URL matches the, the slug that I was sent. Right? Yeah? Hope that makes sense. Uh, the session being, you know, what was actually posted from is part of the push notification. So if I see like slash dev summit slash schedule slash keynote, I'll go, oh, it's the keynote with Darren Fisher is starting now. And I set the icon to be the image of the speaker, which takes me to the next part of the process where I do something that I'm I'm not that fond of. I'll be honest with you, it feels a bit funny, but all the same it works. I take that and I find the image in the cache and then I get a blob of the image and then I use a file reader to read that image as a data URL. And then I set the icon to be that base64 encoded image URL which then means that I can show notification with the title and a message that's been generated entirely from the cache. Your alternative is to just sort of uh, assume that, hey, they were they were they had a good enough connection to get a push, so they probably have enough data to go out and get the image and the text or whatever I feel like sending them. But that's a request that doesn't need to be made, in my view. And also, um, it means that my server has to be able to go, OK, who are you? What do you need to know? Oh, here's the image you need, and here's the whatever. I, I, I didn't seem like it was worth doing to me. It felt like it was sort of a case of, you know what? All I need to tell you is which session is starting, uh, and everything else will take care of itself. Now, if, it, if I send you a push without a message, uh, as in without a, a session, then this bit will fail. Um, I say fail. It just it won't do anything. It doesn't matter. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I just assume that whatever the, the, the literal text is that came in uh, is what we should be sending. So that's how we do the event updates. So if in the back end we just put in like some random string or emoji or whatever, when it comes in, that, that text will not be matched to any of the sessions. So we just propagate it straight through as that's what they wanted to say on, you know, which is true. That's what they wanted to say. They didn't want to say one of the sessions was starting now. Uh, and the icon defaults to the Chrome Dev Summit 512 icon, which is, you probably remember, is this one here. Of, you know, general Chrome Dev Summitiness in an icon. So there you go. Good news is that I'm going to be pushing this out hopefully today, unless I find any catastrophic bugs between now and actually pushing it live. Um, but I've been working on this for quite a while. This has taken some work, not on the client side, surprisingly. On the server side, it's been quite an interesting process of just making sure everything's just aligned and you know trying to make sure that people don't get multi-notified and all that kind of stuff. Ooh, final bit that I will show you uh, is on, you know that user visible only, is that what it was, the, what was the flag? Oh, uh, it was in Push Manager, wasn't it, when we did the subscription? Let me just find out which exactly. Uh, user visible only. Yeah, it was. Because that's set to true, uh, if you remember, I said, when you have that flag, you're promising to show a notification. Here's something I discovered. The event for the on push, you want it to wait until. So you're basically saying, OK, don't don't, don't go away. I've, I've got some stuff to do. Um, and this will take a promise. Uh, and when the promise chain finishes, you, you must make sure that you've shown a notification by that point. And I was finding out that sometimes I'd get my notification, and then sometimes Chrome would say, uh, this website's updated in the background, just so you know. And then I'd also get my notification. So I was getting like a double notification, and I was like, what is going on? Bit of a stack overflow search for me. And it turns out that it's because when you do the self.registration.show notification call, you must return it. It must be part of the promise chain. Otherwise, this promise chain will finish, and there'll be no notification shown. And so Chrome will say, oh, well, they said user visible only was true, so I better put that message up that says this site updated in the background. Fair enough. Uh, and then your show notification code actually then kicks in at some other point, so you end up with two notifications. Whereas if you return it, you're basically saying that event dot wait until will wait until I've shown a notification, which is actually what I wanted to do. So just an FYI, 
I, I don't recall seeing this much in, in uh, various samples around the web about how to actually show notification. Uh, you must make sure that it is, it is returned. So there you go. Codes up on GitHub. Have a proper look around. Uh, as always, thank you for joining me on the journey. We're getting very close to Chrome Dev Summit now. I think it's like two or three weeks away. Uh, so, you know, you can subscribe for notifications if you want to be notified now when you know the event's starting or a particular in event, a particular session of interest to you is actually starting. That's the whole point of this. Uh, and also, there's the code there so you can have a good old look through. Brilliant. Have a great day, and thank you very much for joining me on bonus round number one. Yeah.